morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Jennifer and I'm an educator at Reed Park Sioux, which for those watching around the country is located in Tucson, Arizona. So joining me today is also another educator named Sam and she'll be monitoring the chat box for us. Now, your microphone and your video is currently off and will remain off for the whole presentation. So if you wanted to ask us questions, we ask you to please use the chat box. And also I may be asking you questions during the program as well. So you can use the chat box to answer any of my questions. And the chat box is located at the bottom of your screen. And when you chat, only Sam or educator here at the Reed Parks will be able to see your chats. So today's topic, what we're going to talk about today is beaks. And beaks are tools that birds use to help them eat. And what's really interesting about bird beaks is that the shape of a bird's beak, it helps determine what the bird is going to eat. So if you look at all of these birds on this page, these are birds that are at Reed Park Zoo, but they natively come from all over the world. And even though they all live in different habitats all over the world, you can see that they have the same shaped beak. And this beak is kind of like a multi-purpose tool. So all of the birds on their, this page, they can eat a variety of foods such as fruit, insects, seeds, because of the shape of their beak. It allows them to have a varied diet. So you can see this nice short triangular shape is really going to help them in eating all of those different kinds of foods. So during this presentation, we're going to talk about some different bird beaks and how special they are in helping an animal to survive. So a bird beak is a type of adaptation, since it's something on an animal's body that's going to help them survive. And in this case, it's going to help them to be able to eat certain types of food. So let's get started on our first type of beak. And you guys may be able to realize that these are both different types of ducks. The one on the left is a blue winged tail, excuse me, a blue winged teal. And the one on the right is a rosy billed poacher. And these birds are both aquatic birds, meaning they're gonna live in and near the water. And they're gonna use their beak to help them to get their food. And what they're gonna eat is they're going to eat plants that are in the water and tiny insects that are in the water. And their beak is gonna help them to filter out their food from the water. So they're gonna take a big gulp of water and then use their tongue to push the food out and all their food, the water out, and all the food will be stuck inside of their beak. So Throughout the presentation, I'm gonna be asking you about tools or things that you might have at home that might help you do the same thing. So is there any tool in your house that may help you to filter your food out from water, maybe to strain your food out from water? And you guys can let me know in the chat box. All right, I see some of you are saying that you might use a strainer. A lot of you are saying a strainer. Um, some of you um, are able to maybe use a colander. That's another name for a strainer. So yeah, this is something that, you know, if you're cooking pasta, we certainly need to, you know, we're not gonna reach our hands into the boiling water. So we're gonna use this strainer to pour the water and the pasta in. The water will come out, the pasta will stay inside. And these birds use their bill in the exact same way. Another great example of an animal that is a filter feeder or has to filter or strain their food out of the water are flamingos. And at Reed Park Zoo, we have Chilean flamingos, and this is a picture of them. And they're going to be eating um, small insect-like animals that live in the water and also in the mud. So what they're gonna do is they're gonna stomp their feet in the mud and all of those small insect-like creatures, they're called crustaceans, they're gonna come out of the mud, float in the water. The um, flamingo is gonna use their beak to scoop up all of the insects as well as the water, and again, use their tongue pushing out the water, and they have little combs on the side of their beak that's gonna trap all of those tiny, tiny crustaceans um, that they can then swallow. So they're another great adaptation. Um, you can look at the shape of also of the flamingo beak, Flamingos also eat upside down. So their top of their beak is actually farther down in the water, becomes the bottom of their beak. So it actually acts almost like a scoop to help them eat, um, take in even more of that water and all of those delicious crustaceans. 
And then the next animal, which is also a filter feeder, is this animal. This animal is called a roseate spoonbill. And I actually have a model of one of their skulls. So a model means that it is not a real skull. It's a replica that's made out of plastic. Um, so this is the model right here. And you can see that it looks very much like a spoon. So they'll use their beak as a spoon to suck in all of that water and then be able to keep all of those crustaceans on the inside of their bill so that they can swallow. And you might notice that the spoonbill and the flamingo, they're both pink in color, and they also have something in common, which they eat crustaceans. And it's actually those crustaceans, those small insect-like creatures living in the water, that is turning their feathers pink. So that's something really cool that they're able um, to be able to be that pink color because of the food that they both eat. So moving away from animals that use their beak to filter out their food, we're gonna move into animals that still live in watery or aquatic habitats. And we're going to talk about animals that use their beak um, to kind of pick up food that they're gonna eat out of maybe marshes or rice paddies as in the SARS crane, the large bird that you see on your left. We have an egret that's on your right. And these birds are gonna be eating, again, maybe some insects, some larger insects that are in the water. They're gonna be eating fish as well. And they're gonna use their beak to be able to do that. These birds aren't gonna swim necessarily in the water. If you check it out, they have really long legs that are gonna help them to wade in the water, keeping their feathers above the water height. And also their long beak will help them to stick their beak into the water and keep their feathers on their heads out of the water as well. So is there anything that you guys might have at home, if you think about eating, anything that you might use that might help you to get your food um, and eat it a little better? Maybe something that has a sharp edge, maybe something that's really long. Some of you are saying forks, though that's super great. So it is just similar to us using a fork, particularly if they might be eating fish. For me, what came to mind is chopsticks. So I don't know if any of you guys are using chopsticks. Chopsticks can, for us can be pretty hard to learn how to do. And so they were gonna use their bill as a fork or chopsticks to be able to get that food out of the water. And so I have another model of a skull that we can show you. And this is a scarlet ibis. And first I want you to notice the color of their feathers. So they're pink in color, just like the spoon mill and just like the flamingo. So any guesses on what this animal might be eating that the flamingo and the spoon mill also ate that made them this pink color? All right, and Eduardo, you got it, exactly. There are, and Brody too, you guys are great listeners. You guys are great. You guys have all said that they're eating crustaceans. So thank you to all of you guys that are putting in your answers right now. So yeah, they're eating those same crustaceans, those small insect-like animals that are living in the water. And this is a scarlet ibis, and this is a model of their skull. So you can see their skull looks very, very different, even though they're eating the same types of food that the flamingo and the spoonbill ate. Their bill is very different, and that's because they're gonna use their bill to probe into the mud to get those crustaceans out and also into the water. So they're gonna have this nice long bill. So they're not competing with other animals for their food because they can go dig in the mud to get all of those crustaceans out. So especially special bill that helps them to survive. So we're going to move away to animals that are aquatic animals, and we're going to move into animals and birds that are carnivores. So if you're a bird that is a carnivore, what might you eat? All right, you guys are doing a fantastic job. You guys are all saying meat eaters. So yes, rats are meat as well. So yeah, if you're a carnivore, you're a meat eater. And if you're a great horned owl, like the bird I have pictured, you're gonna be eating all sorts of small rodents like mice. You might eat even other birds. You might even eat some reptiles. And what helps you to be able to catch your food is that nice sharp beak. 
So great horned owls, and I have a model of a skull to show you here too. Great horned owls have this great hook at the end of their beak um, that helps them to really uh, be able to capture their food and also to then tear the meat off of the bone. So if you guys choose to eat meat, is there something that you guys use all the time when you're eating meat that helps you eat a little bit better? Excellent. So you guys are saying a knife. So yeah, the, the beak of a great horned owl is very similar to us with a knife or scissors um, that's going to help us to, to help them to be able to survive and eat that food. Great job. So I have another bird that's a carnivore to show you. And this bird is a king vulture and I have another model of a skull to show you. And the king vulture is not a hunter. So even though it's a carnivore, he's not going to be hunting for his food. Instead, they're scavengers. So they're going to wait for other animals to die. And then they're going to come and eat the carrion, which is the dead animal. And these guys are really great. They're found in almost every type of habitat, not specifically king vultures, but vultures in general. And they're really good at being nature's cleanup crew. So they're really important. And that nice strong beak that you see is going to help them to be able to tear that meat off of the bone, just the same as with the great horned owl's bill. So looking at these birds, you guys can see that these birds, there are tons of colors. The bird on your left is a sun conure, the yellow one, and then the red one is, is an eclectus parrot. And these guys, even though they have really, really sharp beaks, they are not meat eaters. So instead, they are fruit eaters and nut eaters. And their really, really sharp beak is going to help them to break open the fruit and get to the kind of the good stuff inside the fruit, and they're gonna help them to break open the nuts as well. So I don't know about you, but when I eat a peanut, I don't like to eat the shell. I'm gonna peel it and I'm gonna eat the nut inside, and these birds are the same way. They're gonna use their beak as a tool to be able to do that. And so I have a model, another model of a beak to show you, and this is of a blue and gold macaw. And you guys can see, check out just how big and how strong and sharp that beak is. And blue and gold macaws, they can actually do something that is really cool. They can eat fruit that is not yet ripened yet. And I don't know if you've ever tried to eat maybe a pear that's not ripe yet. When fruit is not ripe, it's very, very hard. And so what happens is, is that the, um, this strong beak helps them to be able to break open into that unripened fruit before any other animal can, since most animals, they would need to wait until that fruit is ripened. So this sharp beak gives the macaw an advantage to being able to eat fruit before any other species is able to do that. So I have a video to show you. And this video is of a um, sulfur-crested cockatoo. His name is Kaniki at the Reed Park Zoo. And I wanted you to kind of look at, we'll play the video twice. The first one, I just want you to kind of look at um, what tools he's using in order to help him to shell and then eat his peanut. And then we'll watch it together um, as well. So just kind of watch, it is a short video. So just kind of watch and see what tools he's using. All right, so you may have seen him using, he's using his feet. Um, so he's using his feet just like you and I would use his hands. He's using his beak as well to kind of break open the peanut and also to get the nut that's inside. But check out how he uses his tongue as well. So he's going to use his tongue almost like you and I would use our fingers in order to get the peanut out of the shell. So we'll watch one more time. You guys can see how that really strong beak is really going to help him. And then using his tongue as an extra tool to help him to be able to eat the peanut inside. 
All right, so we have two more beaks to talk about, and these beaks are beaks that are truly, truly unique. So this is a giant hornbill. They're native to Asia, and they live in the rainforest of Asia, and they are fruit eaters primarily. They're also going to eat maybe some reptiles or small mammals, but they're really going to be eating fruit. Now, the problem with eating fruit is a lot of the fruit that they like to eat is high up in the trees. And this is a pretty large bird. So he's not able to hop up on all of the branches because some of the small branches might break if it, he's too heavy for them. So instead, having this nice long beak helps him to be able to reach fruit that might be on a branch that's way too skinny for him to jump onto. So that nice long beak is gonna help him to get his food. And I do have a model of the skull here as well to show you. So you guys can see it's kind of like another arm extension to help him reach even farther. And then the other cool thing about his beak is what's on top of his beak, which makes him pretty unique. This area on the top right here is called a cask. And we're still learning a lot about animals. And right now we believe that this part right here may also play some part in helping the hornbill be able to find a mate in two reasons. The first is that hornbills produce a, a large and loud sound. So the cask on the top might make that sound go even farther in the rainforest so that other hornbills can hear them. And then additionally, in this photo, you, you realize that the hornbill, the cask, is yellow. Believe it or not, the color is not naturally yellow. The hornbill actually colors his own beak to be yellow to attract mates. And he does this by rubbing oils from his feathers onto the top of his cask. And so being this brilliant yellow color um, also helps him to be able to find a mate as well. And our last bird that we want to talk about is the toucan. So this is a type of toucan called an arasari. So a little bit smaller than the um, keeled billed toucan, which is the one that's on your Fruit Loop boxes. But you can still see that he's got, just like the hornbill, this nice long beak to help him to reach fruit that might just be a little bit out of his reach. So that long beak helps him to do that. And then additionally, he has really brightly colored beak, again, enabling him to attract a mate. What you might not notice from the picture, and so I have another type of toucan's bill here. You might be able to see, I'll put it really close. You might be able to see the bill has little edges along the side of it. And this is gonna help the toucan be able to peel the skin off of the fruit. So my last question for you is, do you guys have anything that you might use at home to peel the skin off of fruit that you're eating? All right, perfect. Some of you guys are saying your hands. Certainly, if we're going to eat an orange, we're going to use our hands to be able to peel the fruit. Some of you are saying a knife, and some of you are thinking how I thought with a potato peeler as well. All right, so I want to thank you for joining us today. My at-home challenge for you, no matter what part of the world that you're living, that you're turning into, um, with us today, there are birds in your habitat and in your neighborhood. So I encourage you to either from the window or by going outside to see how many different types of birds you might see out there and then check out their beaks and kind of list how many different types of beaks that you might see, how many different types of shapes. And if you can watch a bird for a few minutes, kind of see them eating, what are they eating? How are they using their beak to help them to eat? So that's kind of a little, a little assignment that you guys can do. Um, just for fun. Um, there's lots of things that we can learn just by observing animals and watching what they're doing. So I want to thank you for joining us. We could take a couple of questions, um, but in case you have to go before questions are over, I just wanted to let you know that we do have some classes coming up if you'd like to join us for another class. And you can visit um, readparkzoo.org to see all of our classes. And again, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to learn more about um, the animals at the zoo and to see some live videos um, from our zookeepers that are working at the zoo. So I want to thank you for joining us. And if there are some questions, if you want to type them in the chat box, and Sam, you can let me know if we have any questions. Hi, Jen. We had a we had a question early on in the 
webinar um, asking about the ostriches that we have the zoo at the zoo and what kind they are. Those are those are just common ostriches. So there are not um, any particular different type of species. Um, ostriches are native to Africa, and we actually have two ostriches um, at the zoo. We do have a male and a female ostrich. And then we had another um, participant ask if owls have the best night vision of all birds. Um, they have excellent night vision. I don't know if their night vision is the greatest of all of the bird species, but yes, definitely they have those nice large eyes to help them to gather in as much as the moonlight as possible. That's allowing them to see um, very well at nighttime. And they're nocturnal, meaning that they're going to spend the majority of their time hunting at nighttime. And then I see we had another question come in, and it might be our last question that we have time for, but um, do vultures eat other vultures? And um, vultures are not picky about the type of food that they eat. So yes, if another vulture um, did pass away, then um, they would be scavenged or probably eaten by other vultures as well. All right, so I want to thank you guys for joining us today at um, the Reed Park Zoo online class. And again, invite you to turn into readparkzoo.org to um, learn more all about the zoo. Thank you for joining.